Hi, media techies. That's what we've decided to call our listenership now. <laughs> this is part one of two episodes we are releasing on our Flagman staff. When we recorded this, as you'll hear, we didn't know whether a second season was on the cards. And now that we know that there will definitely be a second season, maybe shot in New Zealand. We're super excited and even more excited to share our thoughts on the first season with you all. We had so much to say that we ended up splitting the episode into two parts. In this first part, we'll talk about piracy as a performance. The genre of eccentricity. Queer bidding. And of course, we can never talk about queer pirates without talking about black sails. So we hope you enjoy this episode and the second part will be released very soon. Promise. Hi, Lily. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Anna. What's a pirate's least favorite vegetable? I don't know, Lily. What is the pirate's least favorite vegetable? Leeks. <laughs> yep. Wow. And it's sure. like plural leeks as well when it's like vegetable, so it doesn't kind of grammatically yeah. quite make sense. I <laughs> we just used up all the really good ones, the really good ones in the last episode. Yeah. So, you know, um I oh, had to make do. I, I I I haven't checked my joke against your um, oh, you know. your jokes in your episode, so you might get a repeat. Who can say? Who can say go, go, go. it? Oh wait, no, we're, we're, it's the last one, end, end joke. We're saving it, saving yeah. it to the end. So saving that's going to be something we can, that will just be like a bit of tension throughout the episode. <laughs> yeah. It's the final joke. It's going to be something we can slightly before. stressed, like, oh God. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna. I'm Lily. And I'm Lucy. And this is Liliana's pre-read Mediatique. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. yeah. And this week of episode, we have a friend of the podcast, Lucy. She's back Yay! again. Yay! I'm back. Yay! Hey. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, we actually she wasn't even well. No, she was invited, but like um, you what? like specifically. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I knocked on the door. It's like, wow. hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, what I was trying to say is that um, Lucy specifically requested to be on this episode. I believe, like, you sent me a message that was like, if you're gonna do black cell, not black sorry, is she gonna do our flag <laughs> from pirate media? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> How many times is that going to happen this episode? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you said if you want, if you, if we were going to do an Our Flag Means Death episode, you would like to be on it. Um, and so, yeah. and you texted me that, and I was like, oh my god, I'm so honored that you didn't sort of do our yesterday <laughs> episode, and then thought like, okay, let's run far okay. away from this, yeah. <laughs> never again. <laughs> So yes, uh, as we kind of just mentioned, this episode we are going to be looking at the 2022 HBO show Our Flag Means Death, created by David Jenkins. Um, I just included the little summary here from IMDb because I thought it was funny. The year is 1717. Wealthy landowner Steed Bonnet has a midlife crisis and decides to blow up his cushy life to become a pirate. It does not go well, based on a true story. <laughs> Which I'm like, so, debatable, it does not go well. I don't know, it goes, it's complicated, perhaps. It goes okay well. Okay yeah. well, yeah. some things go well, some things go less well. Um, yeah. Drama. And instance. isn't that just life? <laughs> 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 Makes you think. Um, since we started uh, this podcast, also because Lily and I got obsessed with Black Sails, um, we will be talking about the show in comparison to Black Sails. There was a star show that aired from 2014 till 2017, that was set in the golden age of piracy and act as a kind of prequel to the book Treasure Island. Um, so we have real life pirates mm -hmm. in our flagman's death and also fake ones. Wait. Which are the fake we... ones? Do we? Wait, no, I'm not, <laughs> no, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. Kojak was real. I think they're all real. I think they're all based on, I mean, like, okay, based on up. historical characters. And I think you're thinking of, because it's like in Black Cells, they have like a mixture of real life characters right. and right, right, right. Um, like fictional characters, which is interesting to kind of see the parallels between how they portray them as well. Um, but yeah, kind of major spoilers for Black Sails. Um, please go watch also for that. history. <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So 
so I did a, like a little bit of a summary. I'm going to leave out a lot that happens on the show because a lot of stuff happens on the show, but also because we're going to talk about this in detail, but I wanted to give a little bit of a summary for anyone who hasn't watched it. Um, so like Lily said, a wealthy landowner called Steed Bonnet, he has a ship built called the Revenge and hires a crew to sail the high seas, becoming the gentleman pirate. His crew wants to kill him because they don't respect him as a captain. Um, they manage to steal a plant, though, from some fishermen, but run into uh, trouble when they encounter a British Navy ship. Uh, the captain of that ship turns out to be an old school chum, which I wondered, was that a pun on fish? Because isn't that like chum? Or oh yeah, chum like is fish? like a thing. It's like the leftovers of fish or something. I... <laughs> I'm not that sure. had not struck me at all, but... Sorry. <laughs> I like it though. That could, that's a better joke than like, you could have made a better joke out of that than the one that I gave at the beginning. So, um... <laughs> Badminton, who is the old school chum, enters the ship, and when Steed gets angry, he stuns him with a whale paperweight out of metal, um, <laughs> and Badminton dies accidentally by falling on his orange sword. <laughs> like, dies accidentally. <laughs> Whoops! Uh... <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, Steed uses the death um, because Olu advises him, one of his crew members, to use the death to get him respect from the crew. And they keep two British soldiers as hostages and try to sell them. Um, encountering Spanish Jackie, who is brilliantly played by Leslie Jones, who I love so much in the series, but just overall she's so funny. Um, Spanish Jackie's husband was murdered by Jim, a member of Steed's crew, and the crew encounters Easy Hands and Fang and the character that Gus Khan plays, uh, who are members of Blackbeard's crew, who is an infamously vicious pirate from Bristol. And by <laughs> refusing to meet with him, not in this show though, <laughs> and by refusing to meet with him, they spark his interest. Uh, Steed is tricked into being captured and stabbed by Spanish soldiers and gets saved by Blackbeard, who takes over Steed, Steed's ship. Uh, Steed and Ed, who is Blackbeard, bond and they become friends despite Ed's plan to kill Steed and frame him as Blackbeard so he can escape. Izzy, who is Blackbeard's second in command, realizes that Ed has gotten too close to Steed and sells him out to the British, but before they can execute Steed, Ed demands an act of grace, making Steed and Blackbeard soldiers of the British Empire for 10 years. Upon landing in Barbados, Ed confesses his love to Steed and kisses him and they plan to escape together. Steed is kidnapped by the other badminton brother who also accidentally dies. <laughs> Whoops. Um, <laughs> this time he falls, like he shoots and falls on his own weapon. No, he yeah, falls on his own weapon still... and it goes off. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Steed yeah, decides- runs in the family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also the reason why you should never give me a gun. Every time someone goes like, you need to have a gun. I'm like, like not to me it's personally. It's like running Jesus. with scissors. It's like, don't run. Yes. It's like, hold it down and like, yeah. don't run and don't be drunk whilst you're trying to chop things. I've never heard that as advice, yeah. but I feel like that is good advice. <laughs> never try and like cut anything. It's with like scissors. if you, if you have like that thing that swords go in. What's that? A sheath. A scabbard? Sheath. Oh, I or a scabbard. <laughs> scabbard. I think that's from like daggers maybe. Or it's like the fancy version. Of this. If okay. you're fancy, you call it a scabbard. A um, I think it, I think he probably said scabbard in Narnia, and that's yeah, why that's stuck in my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that, that's the reason I'm so clumsy. Like I've generally fallen over standing somewhere. You should not give me a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Steed decides to go back to his wife and children to make things right, but they are doing better without him, making Steed realize that he found true love with Ed. He fakes his own death with the help of his wife, or now ex, well, not really. Ed, meanwhile, has returned to the revenge, and Izzy pushes him to become Blackbeard again. Blackbeard feeds Izzy his own toe to convince him that he's serious and abandons half the crew on a desert island, which I thought was really funny because it looks like what you would draw if you draw like a cartoon of a desert island. Yeah. <laughs> full-on evil Blackbeard again, he throws Lucius overboard and becomes a tyrant captain. Steed's daughter shares the petrified orange that Steed brought home with him with her dad and Steed sets out to join his found family, coming upon half of his crew on the desert island. And that's season one of our Flagman's death. So in this podcast, we talk about the concept of a pre-read text. Um, we use that to talk about the media 
that we analyze. Um, this concept was coined by Rowan Ellis, uh, and it describes when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it is about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. Um, so this kind of like cultural consciousness of this um, like original story is all characters or images or concepts are kind of created through these adaptations. Um, but they might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material and instead just all be kind of from those adaptations. Um, and I think in this um, episode, we'll be exploring ideas and preconceptions within the show, as well as our own kind of preconceptions around sort of piracy and the show in relation to our watching of Black Sails. Um, so that's kind of like, that'll be our, our lens. So we're going to start off talking about ideas about piracy, which is something that we talked about in our Black Cells episode as well, um, which Lucy hasn't listened to, but that's fine. I don't mind. I, um, I mean, I, I think I did, but it was just many months ago. Okay, okay fine. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> save yourself. I'm a good save friend. Yourself. We'll have you back again. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, I think those themes of like ideas about piracy coming quite strongly here. Again, those sorts of things. So like stuff like kind of the hypermasculine pirates, criminality and idea of the child-friendly pirate um, or sort of like you know those sort of tropes of piracy and we're talking both in terms of audience ideas about piracy but also kind of ideas about piracy within the show and like the different characters and their ideas about piracy if that makes sense yeah which also links to pre-read text because exactly. our understanding of piracy is very defined by children's costumes and Given that this is like an actual crime, it's kind of weird how it gets whitewashed in order to be sold within children's narratives and things like that. And how it's sort of known through, that's why it's pre-read text known through stories like Treasure Island, even if you've never read the book. So I think we start out in the show with this idea of like piracy is already faded, and like this kind of golden era of piracy is kind of gone. In the second episode, when they go to the Republic of Pirates and it's immediately like, oh, it's, you know, it's quite gentrified now. It's no longer this kind of like cool and authentic space. And I think that's also interesting because it's like reflected in the characters as well. It's like all the like the main characters like Seed and Blackbeard are like these sort of middle-aged people. They've gone past their kind of golden era and it's especially with Blackbeard as this image of like amazing piracy. This image is already always already passed and we kind of, I mean we do see that in the show but we never see this thing that everyone's sort of harking back to all the time. Oh that's true, that's even like pre-read text in the show yeah. somehow. Like everyone knows who Blackbeard is even though they've necessarily like never even encountered him they know the stories which again comes up a lot in black cells comes up a lot in this show about how pirates sorry i'm already jumping the gun here no no, no it's great go for it go for it yeah. like it's already about how the stories make the pirate rather than the facts Mm. And yeah, and as we encounter Blackbeard on the show, he's already bored. Yes. He's already over it. It's not just, it's not like he's sad because he's older. It's more that he's bored with everything that's already sort of been done at this point. Yeah, because I, I was interested, yeah, in the idea of the like um, gentrified, the idea that the Republic of the Pirates <laughs> had kind of yeah. become gentrified almost. And they were like, oh, it's become really touristy. And that is something that actually really reminded me of Black Sails when Teach arrives in NASA and he's like, this used to be like really rough and tumble and now you've all gone soft and you're here with your nice little pubs that you've opened and you're like having a nice time. And so he's kind of like, this has become gentrified and touristy when he goes to that space. And then you do, because that idea of gentrification does also have roots and ideas of colonialism of like it was once a free space but mm. this is kind of a sort of encroaching on this free space from i don't know forces that are attempting to like civilize it with scare quotes that also the thing that's being lost definitely has kind of this link to like masculinity and like if it used to be rough and tumble and that's the kind of true space so it was all the yeah. complicated yeah it is because it is that kind of like especially when like um, Calico Jack's introduced later on in the series and you used to get these kind of flashbacks to his and Blackbeard's like youth and then you kind of see that's playing out as like older characters and it's sort of this very abusive and toxically masculine piracy. I agree with you basically is what I'm trying to say and I also like the fact that when they get to the Republic of Pirates someone's like oh is that a gift shop and then it's sort of <laughs> And then it's like when they're talking about like the gift shop when that scene with Blackbeard's delicacies and delights oh, and yeah. fishing equipment. And then it's sort of like, <laughs> and it's just like, oh, gift shop. But it's, like, 
it's the idea of like mellowing. This oh, I didn't even pick yeah. up on that. That's so sweet. <laughs> Also, you've got Steed uh, posing in front of, was it a skeleton or something? Oh, and yeah, she's yeah. like, you need to sketch me yeah, in she's... front of this. <laughs> this looks so authentic. This idea of using the aesthetic and not having to deal with the concept of what that reality mm. really looks like. Because when yeah. Steed walks in and wants Lucius to announce him to the pub and everything, to Steed, this is a performance. I am the gentleman pirate and just everyone there just has just no chill for any of this shit. It's also, again, oh, isn't this so authentic? Isn't this so cute? Mm -hmm. Based on the aesthetic, but it's like, there's a reason why this looks like this. And it's because it's technically, wait, well, has it been gentrified at this point? So to have the British overrun this with civilization or have they not? Or has it started? And that's why Roach, yeah. I think, is the one who comments. No, I think Frenchie is the one. So it's like, it's really gentrified now. Yeah, I think and there's like an irony to it as well. Because it's like when they first step off the boat, it's like people just like vomiting blood into a gutter. And it's like, oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's got really upmarket. <laughs> Someone steps up and puts their bloody hands on Lucius. And Skeet gets annoyed with, you couldn't have sidestepped. And you're like, no, dude, this is the authentic bit. But yeah. you don't want to deal with the authentic bit. You don't want it on your nice white clothes. And then, so we have Eve's idea of piracy, which we're going to get into a bit more in a little bit. Um, and then we also have the crew's idea of piracy and the swashbuckling lifestyle. <laughs> Anna, did you want to say a bit about swashbuckling? When I looked up the genre of this television show, one of them was like swashbuckling. I mean, it's technically like a literature uh, genre. Oh, right. Yeah. I was thinking it, it was interesting in terms of masculinity mm. because swashbuckling to me is so camp, right? Like yeah. it's this weird thing of everyone's pretending like someone, you know, flying from a vine and playing around with a sword. It's so performative in a weird way, but it's meant to be really masculine. Yeah. And so I think it's also maybe by like pirate shows went out of fashion for a while because this is meant to be the most masculine thing ever. And then it's like, just like, <laughs> it's actually like an aerobics thing almost. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's um, more... For those of people, well, everyone listening, I just did a nice little kind of like flourish, like a sword flourish. Uh. <laughs> I feel like that's maybe one of the reasons why Pirates of the Caribbean, at least the first movie, worked because they sort of acknowledged that the idea of someone just walking around and like swinging a sword is quite, it is over the top. It is very theatrical. So you have mm -hmm. to either lead into this camp and queer. We're going to talk a bit more about theatricality in a second. I yeah. Think. Um, but I've put down written and oral histories here. Lucy, do you want to kick us off with a bit of written and oral history? Yes. So throughout the show there is this kind of again this is something that really resonates with black sales which is obsessed with both like written and oral histories there's that repeated description of when they're talking about the spanish treasure and it's like let me tell you a story about this person and then you kind of get a very same similar thing in art flag means death where there's this i mean books that feel like so central to the show mm. like the fact that Steed has like this huge library in his ship which is like in the first episode Badminton comments on how impractical it is to have that many books on a ship like by a Ed. fire <laughs> yeah oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then you know you have like all of the um, descriptions of the pirates which are kind of trying to create like an image of these pirates like there's the picture of Blackbeard and then Ed's like I don't need nine pistols I've got one and a sword like everybody else <laughs> but it is kind of <laughs> creating that myth of a figure which again seen in Black Sails there's the same thing about written pamphlets as creating a history about pirates mm. as kind of yeah, presenting them as particularly dangerous to the empire and then yeah there's also all the oral histories alongside all of those books and pamphlets such as like black pete telling the story of blackbeard is creating this mythical figure and so when we do have that scene of him describing this kind of mythical blackbeard that isn't the real one that we see later on it's like this guy with this kind of obscured face with a Bristolian accent, yeah, um, interestingly, <laughs> <laughs> which I like. <laughs> this figure of mist, but he's from Bristol. But he's um, from Bristol. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's yeah. kind of interesting how in A Flag Means Death, Blackbeard in Black Pete's description 
looks more like the painting in the book because the beard is sort yeah. of like it just sticks away in his hair like sticks away from his face more so it looks more like the fog and smoke filled fake one than he does in real life it's kind of funny to me how black pete describing again more a fictionalized version that you see in the book rather than the real person even though the real person is impressive on his own but it just it just needs so much more theatricality to it otherwise people just don't believe in it i think it's also interesting in terms of written in oral histories because we think because of this western idea if you don't write it down it doesn't count mm, yeah it discredits a lot of oral histories as like well those are not reliable because they've never been saved in yeah the way. and i think you see kind of like writing and i feel like i might be stealing this from somebody else's analysis of either black cells or something so i'll if i can find it i'll link it in the show notes yeah but like you can kind of see writing as being used and like literacy is being used as like a tool of colonialism within the show as well yeah um and especially with the reason that they believe seed is a pirate at the end is because it's been written down and they believe the written word and so when lucius can like bring up this even though it's been kind of doctored, this history of his piracy, they then believe that as opposed to just people saying that he's a pirate. It's the kind of written word that they can like take authority from. And then you also have it with the Act of Grace contract. Um, and it's this very, there's this huge document and like Blackbeard signs with an X. And so it's unclear whether like Blackbeard, I don't know whether Blackbeard can read or not, but it's kind of clear that he probably can't write. They're kind of using this very long document and this tool of literacy as a colonial tool like, over these men and so they can never read this document basically that they're sort of signing their lives away to yeah and it's mocking it's mocking the fact that these people that are part of the colonial side have more faith in something that is written down no matter how fake it is but you also see with the pyramid scheme they give them pieces yeah. of paper that have cats drawn on them and yeah. they still think that that's like a valuable legal document because <laughs> neither Olo nor Franchi can read or write and so they just mm -hmm. he just draws cats on this piece of paper and they still respect it because yeah. they respect the piece of paper and the theatricality of it more than they do the reality of it, which is that you shouldn't just buy a third of a pyramid or half a pyramid from a random dude you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good point. And yeah, I don't, and they kind of do the same thing with the like the diary as well. It's using that yeah. kind of, you know, they've got a faith in this, in the written word. So we're going to use this print culture to like exploit that and yeah, use yeah. it for their own game. Yeah. And then what does it mean that one of the final acts of the show is... Blackbeard returning and destroying all of Steed's library. That's oh, yeah. like a destruction of the written word and written representations of, I guess, piracy. It's kind of, it's almost a returning to that oral history and oral mm. myth-making and kind of like yeah. re-establishing because he's kind of in that he's trying to like create himself as a myth again, almost. Yes. And he and uses the image that, from the book. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. uses the image from the book, but also destroys it. <laughs> yeah. What does it's it really, mean? It's interesting because I feel like it's like the oral history and the written history are kind of working in tandem to an extent because it's like, in a way, it's like the oral history is supposed to be working for him as, you know, because in Black Cells, um, there's also this idea of legacy and you kind of want to be known as this incredible pirate because then it means that you don't have to do all the work. Like you can just sort of show your flag and then people will surrender immediately and you have that mystique and legacy and it gives you a lot of power. And there's, yeah, there's a lot of power in that legacy. But in our flag means death it's that say when like black pete creates that image we said it's the same image as the one from the book so these two things are kind of showing to be sort of playing in tandem and it's sort of looking at kind of what that does to a person if they're just created as an image and like this kind of image of monstrosity that's sort yeah. of created around them um which i think is interesting because it's they're kind of doing the same thing even as they're doing quite different things yeah because when frenchies when he tries to get rid of the book and fails hilariously um he just he tries to say that it's all made up he says cannot stop imagining him steve bonnet in all different scenarios it's all totally made up it mm. just to me sounded so much like fan fiction yeah he calls, he calls it fan fiction he calls it fan fiction yeah and it's so interesting because it's like they don't believe it they're like no the written word is truth and yes. like yeah except apart from what's his face the twin whose name i've forgotten the badminton, badminton. Twin. Yeah. yeah um but yeah like they're like finally no, they gave a british character a name i can remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah but they do believe it just because it's written down and even though the person who has the book is saying like no 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 this is completely it's just a grabby marketing hook which i thought was so funny is that a pirate 
pun because of hook. Hey, uh, uh, okay. oh, <laughs> oh. uh, this show is going to occur to me. <laughs> I'm getting ready for your joke at the end, Lucy. I'm very I'm you know, building ready. up expectations now. Uh, when they show the plant at the end, it's grown. Like it was quite oh. like craggly and dry at the beginning when they stole it, and then at the end it's green because they've he's wanted it into oh. yeah, he's, oh, nurtured yeah. That plant. it's been nurtured alongside with them and they're all growing together i feel like now's a good time to maybe transition into talking more about blackbeard and i mean we've kind of been talking about that already actually you know what i was thinking of was the flag as well as a piece of media and print as well oh, and yeah. kind of because i feel like the symbol of the flag is quite important in the show and it goes through different meanings and because the crew understand, like Annie wrote down, like the crew understand, like the flag is like a very important piece of legacy within the show. The branding, the, the branding. branding, the brand, <laughs> the pirate brand. Yeah, and I think it's interesting as well because when they take, because uh, there's the cat flag that has the best, all the, one. the best, the best one. Um, <laughs> but when um, Steve kills Badminton and like the they revolt against the crew, the British Navy crew. They use that flag and they take it back to Britain to like show to the king and to be like, this is what's happened. Like, this is the, these are the pirates we're tracking down. There's blood on it. Like, look, using it as like a way of, you're yeah, like tracking them basically. As proof, yeah. Yeah, as proof. And it's sort of like, it's the kind of danger of leaving that legacy as well. And what kind of the flip side of that is. And that it, it, once you become recognizable and you have a name and a legacy, then the consequences can also follow you as well. And it becomes, it, that signification is taken out of your hands and becomes like a way of branding you as a pirate and then forcing consequences on you, which I thought was yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. It's sort of more like the emotional truth of it, which is that that flag means scary, means death, mm, rather than like yeah. the reality, which I don't know that that person's going to kill me. Also in like the openings to every episode is like, oh yeah, that's yeah. all things being carved in. Like that's all about written word <gasps> on like oh pirate materials yeah I'm, I'm thinking of like the guy's like chest he's been carved yeah. in, but like there's so many other ones yeah. as well of like there's yeah. the um, children's toys children's toys yeah and that's the kind <laughs> of like that steed's idea of playing a pirates thing and it becomes yeah. that and i think it's in episode nine when they actually have a flag that is a flag that has our flag means death on it for the title mm. interesting to track those and sort of see the progressions there but yeah it is very significant interesting my favorite one was the one where they carved it into sand because like then the wave came and sort of took it away and i remember watching that thinking one which crew member had to do like crew member <laughs> um had to do that for the show because that must have been a huge pain in the ass <laughs> because like you have to sort of time it perfectly so the waves like take it out oh, i reckon it was time. cgi i reckon it was think so? cgi yeah because oh. it would have been t i mean maybe maybe they went the extra mile and like carpet no, in the sad. sand but it'd be <laughs> I, like really really I quick believe, and be like I before the wave the, comes in <laughs> i believe the performance silly i believed it <laughs> <laughs> But I just, so many like now crew members post images of doing the writing on like different versions of them oh. and like sh posting all of it on Instagram. Once they sort of realized, I think that the fans just want to see all of it. Yeah. I just assumed that someone was on a beach during that. Yeah. <laughs> because like at some point it's also carved into a boat, isn't it? Maybe they did, they probably, maybe they did put it into sand, but then they CGI'd the wave maybe, potentially. That makes more sense because yeah, that, yeah. Oh. now that I'm thinking about it, it seems quite <laughs> ridiculous. What I wanted to say, sorry, was the idea that putting it into sand sort of makes it a reality and a fact for a second. But then because, again, with the books, you can destroy all this. Mm. Like writing as much as it's a, like a physical yeah. or something mm. existing, you can still destroy it. Ed yeah. throws out the books. You can just burn a piece of paper. It just, yeah. And then I guess that's also like so many pirate histories, are they are kind of lost in the sand. They're kind of washed away Whoa. because you don't have those like <laughs> stable documents that have been preserved. They kind of, it's like a an, an unstable history because we value written documents over everything like as a, as a culture. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have those and they're transitory, mm. then they um, kind of leave. Yeah. And it's also like who gets to write the documents, who gets to write the history about these people. Mm -hmm. You get those narratives about these people, but like if they can't read or write, then they can't write them th themselves. And so like if, once you lose those oral narratives, I mean, like within the show, the oral narratives are also about these people, but then, it, yeah, you lose the authority to kind of write about yourself and to tell your own story as well. At um, one point, the title card is written into a skull. 
at what point it's written into the moon. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I'm going to talk about the moon later because I'm like interesting oh, yeah, yeah. symbolism there. I just got so mad in the pilot episode when the British soldiers were holding up the different flags that they sewn that they had sewn and were like, doesn't this look ridiculous? And every single one of them, I was like, that looks dope. You're just disrespectful. Like, <laughs> yeah, I would love to have every single one of these on my wall. Like they're yeah. like, also the, the one where like a skull was vomiting another skull and like, oh, all the, buttons. <laughs> the buttons. The buttons, like, yeah. Like, the buttons so are great. Pretty. So you just have no taste. <laughs> no. And the cat one is just, yeah, it's just so good. And they put up all the flags. They put up all yeah. the flags. Like, so there yeah. is a one fixed signification of that flag. There's like so many different, there isn't one fixed pirate flag in the same Ooh. way there isn't like one way to be a pirate. Though there are like... It's like kind of the antithesis of with Black Sails then where massive spoiler alert for the end of Black Sails. Calico Jack in that series creates the Jolly Roger like symbol. Or like in the last frame oh, you yeah. see the like a skull and crossbones type thing. Or it might be skull and cutlasses, I'm not sure. But like it's the kind of like iconic... Yeah. flag but oh my god i just didn't put this together but the reason why you have the kids toys as the title card is because that's the kids understanding of yeah pirates because to them it's a game it's something they yeah. play with their dad oh, yeah and it's the, again it's the like idea of like children and pirates and the yeah which is yeah, still yeah. what we have now as well as yeah, yeah yeah ah yeah yeah so i guess it's... maybe those title cards can be read as like different people's perceptions of pirates like it's all about yeah. kind of so some people see it as something in the sand that's being washed away, children see it as this, some people see it as putting it into, like, carving words into people's bodies. Some yeah, just like, kind of brutality. Yeah. yeah. Each episode kind of gives you a different lens on piracy and, like, what it means and sort of also a kind of progression on sort of, like, our understanding of piracy throughout the show and the character's yeah. understanding. Yeah. And it introduces you in the pilot episode as the black flag that just has a right, our flag means death written on it, which is, like, our most basic understanding of like pirates flex just like black sail a black flag and then just like white is that in the symbols. first episode or is that's that the in... pilot yeah oh because i thought it was in the ninth episode or maybe it i goes thought back the same the i thought the same i think because it's the most um if you scroll down you can see it. i think yeah. it's because it's the most basic the because it's in front of the beach and the sea i think it's just the most basic thing and then they go into different versions of it and then they come back to it by that point. Yeah. It's like your perception it's the of it same. has changed. It's the same one. It's the same one in the ninth but episode. It, but it's become different because yeah. so much has happened yeah. in between. Yeah. And, what, and what's it in the last episode? I can't remember. It's on a mirror. <gasps> yeah. Oh my God. Oh, because it's about mirror. identity. <laughs> oh, wait, no. So, so, sorry, sorry. That's not a mirror. That's a painting oh. of like... Oh. <laughs> Oh, sorry, that's well, still. still life. <laughs> still, yeah, like, that's... <laughs> I thought it was a mirror for a second. I'm sorry, but it's red on. It's still like a, got quite sort of it's the flare. Paint, yeah. Okay. But it looks, but it's like a still life of fruits and vegetables and stuff. So that's still like imagery. Oh, but are there yeah. any leaks in that fruit bowl? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to make this joke work. Um, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, would have preferred if it would have been a mirror. That would have been so much cooler. Uh, yeah, guys, you could have. <laughs> <laughs> I keep yeah. forgetting the name of the seagull, but what's the um, Carl? Carl, the one where I said it was on the on a boat. It is on a boat, and uh, Carl is sitting on the edge. Oh, yeah, Carl, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite crew member. I might just briefly talk about theatricality now because I found that very exciting because I feel like again with the whole like image and like performance of piracy I think episode five is kind of where that becomes that it's the most prevalent theme or like it's when it becomes most prevalent um and that's the see the episode where they do the art of fuckery theater of fear <laughs> and like it's that episode um and I was just like because there's so many Hamlet references in that episode yeah. and I only kind of got that on the second view I was like oh yeah like this is just entirely Hamlet but it's great <laughs> um <laughs> I just saw him holding up the skull and I was like I got that reference yeah <laughs> <laughs> and again and again we can have like pre-read text of like Shakespeare yeah, totally. as well oh um, yeah all that stuff <laughs> happening interesting because it, and it's also interesting because it's like Izzy quotes like Shakespeare a couple of times and I think also because it's the idea of Shakespeare as being 
um it's sort of like seen as this very like highbrow literature but also at the time it was most people like watched or like not most people but like if you were in london you'd watch shakespeare not to like to be like it's universal but a lot of you know you'd sort of get your kind of very cheap ticket and stand in the pits and you'd watch your shakespeare um lucy you probably know more about this than i do at this point because you've written quite a lot about hamlet and things but yeah izzy sort of quotes twice as well he's like so here's the rub and a pox on all of really? you really um yeah holy yeah. shit that's amazing sorry I, just, so I, I wonder, did not pick up on that <laughs> so i wonder whether that's he watched a performance of hamlet maybe at some point or like whether Ooh. that's just like showrunner like the writers just like popping it in there for fun yeah Right. Yeah. And it's also the idea of, it's like Steve's like, okay, I want to do psychological horror and literary, whereas the crew are like, well, I saw someone being stabbed this one time and that was quite scary. And it's their lived experience versus his kind of idea of kind of literary horror. And you've got a lot of people kind of standing behind curtains, which again is very Shakespearean, like when Izzy's talking to Steed and when Ed's like watching the last kind of scene of it and he's like behind the curtains. Yeah. And it's like the kind, well, of, like, that's the kind of a lot of those dramas as people being behind curtains because they yeah. like h- hide at the back of the stage and then get stabbed or listen in or yeah. those, that is, yeah, all about performance. Also making fun of this idea of the way that people are who make theatre because steed is in like black turtleneck just yeah. self-important director none of you are taking this seriously <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's like the, it's like such a big theater mood as well it's like kind of either it's like you spend like ages trying to do something and just like nothing happens or you get it done yeah, in like 20 yeah. minutes it's like I, <laughs> it's like with the crack and reenactment as well that's like the kind of hamlet play within a play and sort of like when it's in hamlet when hamlet's trying to find out whether claudius has killed his father he kind of has this play be put on where it's someone like dribbling poison in someone's ear it's supposed to like show Claudius has this massive reaction to it and it's like it, he's guilty and it's the same thing kind of happens with the Kraken at the end when Ed watches it's that kind of memory of him killing his father and so you have that and then it's really sad because like in the end like they're not very scared of the fake Kraken but they're scared when Blackbeard comes out from behind the curtain because he's the Kraken <laughs> I mean so they sad. are scared of Jim they're all scared of Jim like oh yeah the sausages <laughs> <laughs> yeah like the shadow theater as well that kind of it's also like a kid's aspect of it of just you're not even seeing anything you're just reacting to a shadow behind a curtain <laughs> yeah with some sausages being like pulled out of someone's yeah. stomach but it is it is odd that it's kind of like it's the performativity that tries to reveal the like truth almost it Mm. is because that's what happens in hamlet it's the classic the plays the thing wherein we'll catch the conscience of the the king King. and it's we're finding the truth of the matter through performance and through fake Mm. words we will find the true words and Yeah. yeah you do have that same idea of theatricality and that kind of does suggest that there is even though there's performativity, it suggests that there is like some sort of essential self that is found through performativity. Mm. Like kind of what seems to be suggested because by them actually being afraid of Ed at the end as opposed to the image of the Kraken. Yeah. That is kind of still trying to present some sort of truth behind the performativity. But then it's... Ed is the image of Blackbeard so again it's like another like oh, image yeah. and another performance yeah. that is then being revealed through this other so it's just like many layers of performance and he comes out from behind a curtain as well which is very yeah, yeah like the truth is revealed but then it's like <laughs> and then but then it's interesting because he's crying in that moment but they don't see sort of his fear they just see him as a symbol of fear and it's like yeah. the myth rather than the man that they see and then he like crawls into another room and, I will like, say they're also scared of behind a curtain yeah, yeah. so Oh yeah, scared the... of Lucius because <laughs> just he... literally... because that's just... not performativity. No, that's, that's just... not <laughs> <laughs> And again, it's like mixing, yeah. But it's like the mixing of the true and the non-true, and, yeah. and everyone yeah. thinks like, "How did he do that? Like, wow, what a, what a <laughs> trick!" And it's no, he did it literally just chop his own finger off. But it's kind of like difficulty of um, appearance and reality, and sort of like yeah. performance and truth, all those things mixing together in a very confusing way. It's sort of quite difficult to pick them apart also we john dressed up as a cat and it's again it's the cats being terrified so and i'm much. like is this yeah it's like so it, much is this Just a reaction <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm a witch and here is my cat. <laughs> and it's also like is this a reaction to like cats like the film as well or like the music i just so kept like, thinking very... this is better than that entire <laughs> this is better. movie was oh my god yeah, yeah. We've mentioned this before, but we watched um, Cats the movie on Halloween last year, or year before oh, last. Oh no! Because yeah, yeah, we were like, last. oh, it'll be really scary, but like not like a real scary movie, because we can't deal with those, and it was just very strange. And I'm, I'm not <laughs> I mean, sure it I was traumatising. It. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> 
I would like run off that boat in a heartbeat <laughs> if that's not happening. I also just thought it was interesting because watching the first episode, I, again, I didn't pick up on this the first time I watched it. It's so important that they want to not maybe kill Steed because he's quite good at performing yes! stories yeah. for them. Because Lucius can read, but he doesn't do the voices as yes, well. Do the own voice. Do the own voice. <laughs> and it's like Pinocchio as well. It's like the story of like wanting to be like a real boy and sort of like oh, coming yeah. into your own. And again, truth and react, like kind of like becoming real rather than fake. So I had to love so hard when he goes me me legs or sticks <laughs> <laughs> wait how old is that story we're in 1717 like jesus oh. that's that must be a really old fucking story then i didn't know that pinocchio was that old <laughs> but performing it is so important it's not just the mm. written word because lucius could feed it to them but they want it performed <laughs> yeah and it's again the mixture of the oral and the written and them kind of like coming together yeah yeah mm. Lucy, do we want to move on to the genre of eccentricism? Eccentricism. Yes. Eccentricism. 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 Thank From you. From the word eccentric. Yeah. So after watching Our Flag Means Death, I was like, this really, it does really resonate with black cells. It really makes me think of it. But what is it that makes these two texts kind of work together? Because this was, I went on Tumblr for like the first time in years to be like, what are people saying about these two shows specifically interacting with each other yeah and like there seemed to be a first wave of people who were like now that this show is trending everyone go watch black sales like it's really great it was really underrated at the time um and so a lot of people said that and then there was a second wave of people saying this is a really weird recommendation to give based on this show which is like really cozy and uplifting yeah. And really wholesome and you're recommending like this gritty pirate drama <laughs> this doesn't make sense they're like apart from like the fact that both have canonically queer pirates there's like nothing there's no relation and i was like mm. that doesn't feel true to me yeah but yeah there was this kind of idea that it was basically inappropriate to recommend black sales to people who liked this show because they were like no this is cozy and comforting it's not like dark and violent <laughs> and so I think the thing that really resonates between the two is this idea of eccentricity. Both are eccentric shows, and I'm going to explain that more in a bit, but I would like to say that I did get this from one of my module conveners from last year, who is writing a book about British post-war comedies and the genre of eccentrism. So that's... Ooh. Benedict Morrison and I should credit this Benedict. idea. <laughs> Benedict! I've he's heard so much about him. He's amazing. So yeah, so we do kind of associate eccentricity with comedy and there is like there is a very specific where we're like this feels particularly British and eccentric and we have the like idea of a person who we would call like a harmless British eccentric mm -hmm. who I think seems kind of like the steed figure like people are like oh he was like a like an eccentric pirate from the this time i think maybe like in black sails you could say that oh my god what's he called thomas yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. he, he <laughs> no I, i'm brain. laughing i'm laughing because <laughs> another I tom asked lily like a couple of days <laughs> yeah. ago what was the guy called that he was fucking <laughs> they're, all, they're all called thomas they're, they're all, all called, called thomas. Thomas. if in doubt it's thomas, thomas. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like also like an eccentric figure and eccentric has its connotations of being whimsical and cozy and fun but generally harmless and actually that's how many people are describing our flag means death it's like whimsical cozy sweet eccentric bit odd but like wholesome yeah wholesome yeah, yeah. but eccentric is actually not being harmless it actually has this kind of really political meaning if you break it down, it's literally outside of the centre. It's not centric, it's eccentric. It's decentered. it's outside of the centre. It's like quite literally existing out of normative structures is what being Ooh. eccentric is. Hmm. And I am now unfortunately going to do a Derrida quote. So, um, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so it's a bit of a mouthful and I'm going to try and explain it afterwards. But when he describes what the idea of the centre, he says, quote, 
The function of the center is not only to orient, balance and organize the structure, mm -hmm. but above all, to make sure that the organizing principle of the structure would limit what we might call the play of the structure. So essentially the center is what keeps the structure in place. Uh -huh. If you're thinking about a classroom, the center of the structure is the teacher. Mm -hmm. It's kind so of the nucleus within, of the cell, not the nucleus, the nucleus oh, of the cell, uh, not the nucleus, no, no, not the nucleus, the, uh, like an atom. It's like the nucleus of the atom or whatever. And it's like the, the, the oh, I can't remember my physics at all, but like the bit in the middle and then it kind of, then the things gravitate around it. Yeah. Like a solar system. That's easier. Like I understand how to system. talk about a solar system. Yeah. Okay. Gravitational pull. Yeah. Yes. So being in the center is being within like the normative structures. Okay. Being eccentric is basically destabilizing a destabilizing of structures it's being allowed to play outside of normative structures okay which is essentially by definition what piracy is it's saying right. we're not going by the like society we're literally not on the land where this these structures are taking place mm -hmm. we're kind of outside of that so Ooh. pirate life is by definition eccentric. It is out of the centre. Yeah. So both these shows are eccentric. Their protagonists are eccentric figures, both in the like, you could say Flint is eccentric because he's eccentric to both pirate life and to... Oh, um, that's true. Out in society, British life. So I think that's why they kind of resonate with each other. Like Our Flag Means Death is that kind of cosy, sweet fun, but also eccentric it's kind of outside of kind of what you expect from both comedy and pirate shows and its characters are also eccentric so yeah this is my thesis this is super interesting <laughs> no, yeah. because it, the eccentricity is also plays into the campness of it yeah like whether you go along with this idea that it is eccentric or whether you just sort of go like no this feels too much out of the structure and therefore I just don't want to sort of follow along with the story. So I think it is essentially this kind of working outside of these, both these shows are about characters that aren't working within or are actively working against the normative structures mm -hmm. of non-pirate society. So kind of outside of the family, outside of I don't know. Yes. Yeah. The normal ways to earn capital outside of yeah. Yeah. It fits into like yeah. the queerness of the show, which we're gonna like talk about very, very soon as well. Yeah, I put up Steed next to talk about. Um I mm -hmm. feel this is like I'm just like reevaluating everything that I've ever known. Um, wow. wow. Yeah, so I'm inter <laughs> interested in like if you think of Steed as an eccentric figure as in outside of the center, mm. not necessarily as like the kind of he he is the harmless eccentric. Yeah. yeah, I think that, I mean, I was going to talk about this as part of the closing thoughts, but I think this just fits too well into your really, very mm -hmm. well eloquently established thing of eccentricity. When I started watching the show, I sort of felt like, oh no, I don't, I'm not going to like this. Because there is this idea of the eccentric, eccentric especially white dude who is mm -hmm. bad at doing things in comedy and YouTube videos of just men like being shit at baking, being shit at cleaning, being shit at babysitting, being shit at stuff. And this idea of weaponizing competence that is sort of sold through the comedy of eccentricity because it's, you know, like he tries to bake a cake or something and then like flowers everywhere or whatever. And you're just like, oh, this is so funny because it's so over the top and it's meant to look eccentric and that's supposed to make you laugh. And I was just, I don't enjoy watching men be shit at basic things when everyone around them just has to work hard. It just, I get the comedy aspect of it. I get where the joke is supposed to land. I just don't find it funny. And it took me like two episodes to like get into the show because I thought this is not funny to me. Like, I get it, white rich dude has a pirate crew. Ha ha ha. I just thought this is not going to be fun for me. And that's not what the show ends up being about, but that's kind of the eccentricity. The idea of eccentricity is also meant to be, I think you said it like harmless, right? But it isn't 
because you're supposed to laugh at someone's being outside of the center, whether that's supposed to be because that makes it makes that person less vulnerable to criticism, which would be good, especially when we talk about queerness, that we don't laugh at someone or we or like laughing at someone makes us less likely to punish that person because we don't take it as seriously, which is still discriminatory, but it creates less danger for that person. When I was starting to watch the show, I just thought, oh God, no, I'm just, I don't want to watch like episodes upon episodes of a white dude being bad at like a rich dude, no less just being bad at a job that people had to do because they couldn't exist in other spaces. And then it, again, was something that was being subverted for me here because I was like, oh, it's not about the eccentricity of him being ridiculous. That's such a small part of this whole thing. And I feel like that's maybe also maybe what invited a lot of bros and dudes into the show. One of the reasons why I don't think you see him as queer is because he seems so over the top and British that sort of camouflages a lot of the queerness. Yeah. In terms mm. of gender performance, sorry, I'm like jumping the gun, but in terms of eccentricity, that's one of the reasons why it almost turned me away from the show quite early on. And then sort of realized that that's, again, something that sort of did quite intentional here. And it's not the, it's not the basic joke that I hate so much of like, look at him sort of failing. Isn't that funny? Because I find incompetence in men, especially weaponized, whether that's intentional or unintentional, really, really, really not funny. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to briefly um, kind of talk about piracy and queerness and connection within that genre. This idea of like the freedom of the seas, the kind of homosocial environment of pirate vessels. You've got like historical figures such as Anne Bonny, and there's a really good bad gays episode on Anne Bonny and sort of like talking about her as like this kind of historical, like potentially queer figure. But like there's again, not very much historical record on her and what is written about her is written from like a colonial lens. It's very interesting. I'd recommend reading about that yeah. um, and going to look at that episode. And you've got kind of like kind of cross-dressing and possible trans readings of people such as like Mary Reed. Also like these ideas about like kind of gay marriage on pirate vessels and all these kind of different kinds of freedoms that you get again, like linking back to eccentricity and kind of like living outside the rule of law and these freedoms that you get on pirate ships. And so piracy's kind of become this queer genre in a way. I mean, what, uh, what Lily was talking about in terms of like gay marriage and stuff like that, or like queerness on ships is that, that there were like contracts, type of contracts established. So you could, because it was quite like a lot of ships just didn't have any women on them. So this, you could sort of like leave your money and your, like what you owned to another man on the ship, things like that. So there were sort of kind of types of uh, yeah. queer things established within piracy. And again, when we talk about piracy, we also need to be aware of the fact that we're never talking just about one set of structures or culture, because obviously, because we're talking about the high seas, we're talking about very, very diverse group of people everywhere on earth. So like piracy wasn't just established in one part of the earth. And when we talk about the golden age of piracy, we're talking about like an 80 year span of time mm. within like a certain part of the earth. And I mean, the show specific, we're talking about like around Barbados. But that's a good point. There's this sort of idea that like pirates had gay marriage, but it sort of like wasn't in the bad gays episode, they explained that like that wasn't kind of quite the idea around it. But at the same time, there is still like quite a lot of like potential around piracy is like this very subversive space, like not just in terms of like gender and sexuality, but also in terms of like class and racial hierarchies, although like not entirely, of course. But like there's sort of like more potential of like kind of creating alternative structures and like kind of different things like within this space um but again that's kind of what shows like this is kind of drawing from this is sort of like historical potential and then like yeah. building it into like something slightly different um, there's this idea that queerness is like the antithesis of masculinity and it's interesting because in a lot of these macho spaces where women are just not present a lot of men not just in pirate ships but also like in armies and stuff a lot of men realize um i might be interested in other men i just thought it was so funny because um sorry i just was watching like that clip from um black sales again and when he talks about um when flint talks about how they sort of create these monsters and dragons in the shadows and it's just such a beautiful description, I think, of queerness in, like, again, eccentricity living outside of the norm, outside of the structure that you're forced into the dark because he says in the dark there's discovery, there's possibility, there's freedom in the dark once someone has illuminated it. And I don't know, that just, just so connects to me, Steed and Ed sort of realizing that they love each other 
because even within their own structure outside of the center, there's still even more possibilities to be found. And that just, I don't know, I, just, I think that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I want yeah. to talk about that with the moon later as well, yes. but I'm oh, not going to bring it in just yet. No, no, oh no. Oh my no. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, the moon. <laughs> there's so much. I was just like, I just got a bit obsessed with the symbol of the moon, like on my green watch. I was like, hang on. <laughs> But yeah, we won't jump ahead. We'll we'll leave that for like a little bit. Piracy is a really good genre to use for queerness because it's like the freedom of the seas and you have these queer environments just for the lack of a certain gender being present. That's a weird way of phrasing that. But um, <laughs> I just thought because it was, I was looking through like all the different songs that were used for the show and also the, the soundtrack that was made was really good. It's made by the same composer who also composed the score for Sims 2. So... <laughs> 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 Highly oh my recommend. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so good. In the Cat Stevens song, the lyrics, some of the lyrics are, <clears throat> I have my freedom. I can make my own rules. Oh, yes, the ones that I choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just I just think that's so beautiful. <laughs> I think it's really funny because it's like the soundtrack's great, but it is very much like kind of boomer dad music. That was yeah, like, totally. <laughs> <laughs> like, and here's the chain by uh... <laughs> that, that, the Mac. chain was 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 also in Black Sails. Wait, what? No, wait, what? <laughs> what? Actually, I don't How? know if it was. How there was, was one it? song that was in both Black Sails and our Black Queen's Death. That I'm was... like, that's so funny. How, How did I never notice that? In Black Sails. Excuse me. <laughs> no, but like it is so boomer because like when Leonard Cohen started playing, I remember thinking like, oh, of course it is. I love Leonard Cohen, but because of my dad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, but Lou Reed, nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, when perfect was the day train? was the most exciting part. I'm I'm looking it up mm. now. I I can't. I just like a black sales train. And it was like, do you want sales on a train? No. <laughs> wow. When would it play? I can't remember. So I'm trying to think, because I'm like, mostly Black Cells didn't do the thing that Our Flag Means Death does, which is where it kind of like, is a show set, like a period show, but sort of doesn't like, doesn't take itself too up. seriously. Yeah. yeah, it's like, we'll do this kind of loosely, we'll take it loosely. Whereas like Black Cells was more kind of like, we're in the genre, we are in this time period and we're not going to sort of like fuck around and dress mm -hmm. people in Crocs or whatever. Is it um, possible that they did the thing that Bridgerton does where they played like an acoustic version of this? Oh, song potentially, maybe? yeah. Like that the song itself wasn't really played in the background. It's like the... thank you next whilst people dance around a yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll look this up after Lucy. We'll we'll yeah. we'll I'm yeah. I'm distressed and I can't find it. It's fine. We'll, we'll it's move so on. It's so annoying we'll when you're like, it. no, but I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. I just can't <laughs> find it right now. <laughs> we'll put a pin in that for now and we'll yeah. Okay. Yeah. We will come yeah. back to that. So in terms of queerness in media, one of the things that was quite compliment on the show is that they didn't queer bait, even though everyone expected them to be queer baiting with the show. And I just wanted to define queer baiting for a second, because I do think it's sometimes used in a way where I'm like, I think you mean queer coded. It just doesn't necessarily always mean the thing that people I think want it to mean. So queer baiting specifically is a marketing technique. So uh, this is from Wikipedia, <laughs> fiction and <laughs> entertainment. And so the idea is that a creator or show writer uh, or showrunners or writers hint at queerness specifically without ever wanting to actually show you any sort of same-sex romance or LGBT representation in any way, shape or form. So the idea is that they sort of make jokes about things. They sort of hint at the idea that these people have had a queer past or something like that. And or that they might be interested sexually in a different character, but it's always the way that it's being played in terms of queer bidding, it's like it can always be read as a joke to mm. straight audiences. It's always like subtext and it's like you have to be looking for mm. it, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, totally. And in this show, you just don't have that because so it's always needs to be queer bidding. The reason queer bidding exists and it's so atrocious is because it gives studios a way to sort of say to conservative audiences, like, no, 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 we don't let the queers exist in our show. And it also gives queer people, because we're so used because of the Hayes code and stuff like that, we're so used to having to read subtext. We just always are waiting for that kind of stuff. And so when we see it happening, we're just like, oh my God, is that going to be queerness on the show? And that creates fan art and creates interest online. 
on Tumblr. <laughs> and <laughs> then people just get essential like free marketing for their own. Mm -hmm. And this is what the show didn't do. And we, one of the texts we read for this episode was Act of Grace by Gittleman, which we're going to link. It's a very good article on mm. our Flagman's death. And I'm just going to quote them for a second. The subtext is text and it is not sanitized. It is not dismissive. It takes up space because we don't have to look for a subtext. So the subtext is Chekhov's gun in a way. They pick it up later. Like every yeah. look, when you rewatch the show, every look, every smile, every glance, it gets picked up within this one season and you don't have to wait for it. They don't promise it to you later on. Like I remember there was an interview with the showrunner of, what was the show called? With What's the natural? No, the, <laughs> the Marvel one with the S.H.I.E.L.D. guy. Uh, um, Captain something and Winter Soldier. <laughs> <laughs> Captain something. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch Is that it. Falcon and the Winter Soldier? Falcon, that one. thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Yeah, he said something on the show where he said he was on dating apps and there were a lot of tiger pictures, which a lot of fans then interpreted as, which makes sense. They were like, well, men post with tigers on dating apps. That makes no sense because women don't do that. So this must be like a hint for this character to mean that he is canonically now queer. And then the showrunner was interviewed about this. And at the time, because they don't air like in one chunk, they air weekly. He said, oh, you have to keep watching. And of course, there was nothing done about that because either like some either a queer writer just put that in to like fuck with them. I don't know, or they did this intentionally, or they just didn't think about it, and this was just a mistake they made because they were like, "Isn't it funny how on dating apps men post with like people post with tigers or whatever?" And then didn't think about the consequences of what that would mean for the because obviously if you're not interested in dudes like you don't see men's pictures on dating apps yeah but it's like that kind of shit just this show doesn't do that is my point <laughs> our flagman's death doesn't do that yeah i think i read something else and i can't remember where i read it now but i'll try and find it to link it where they were talking about how you kind of have the main central romance but then you also kind of have all these kind of queer romances around it like the whole space is sort of like yeah the whole culture and like the environment that's very queer as well yeah. not just like the central romance which is also really nice and sort of like mm. it just the well, whole vibe i must say because like going into it i knew that there were going to be like some queer relationships but the fact that there were ones around meant I think you could still not be sure if you yeah. were being queer baited with yeah. the main yes, 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 yeah. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. like, okay. <laughs> so you still had that, like, is this happening? Is or, yeah, or is that was like my, everyone yeah. else. <laughs> it was yeah. just all of us, this, all of us just Lucius watching the two of them talk about the fishing shop in the, uh, the gift yeah. shop thing, which is like, this is happening. Is this happening? <laughs> yeah. This is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I have a long spreadsheet of just gay movies that I've been watching for like half a year now. And a lot of them are short films because queer media doesn't get made a lot, but also a lot of them are really bad. Just in terms of sometimes it's the quality, sometimes it's the writing, sometimes it's just weird stereotypes that's just come up in tropes that I hate and everything. And I just was thinking about this is a white straight cis showrunner why did he make such a good queer show and i was just thinking about what they don't do and so so they don't center only white thin cis people in every plot and storyline so you have ed they made uh, blackbeard indigenous which i think other than racist assholes on the internet no one gave a shit about but it also just enriches the storyline because it connects again to racist ideas of monstrosity of violence of that kind of stuff with the way that izzy talks to blackbeard and like demanding him to sort of go back to his old ways. You have uh, Jim, you have Olu, you have Black Pete, you have Wee John. Like everyone on the show just isn't at the same time thin, white, and cis, or even male. I just looked up Gus Khan's character's uh, name because I couldn't remember. But like Yvonne, you don't just only center people in their 20s or early 30s, which is an overall issue that I have with rom-coms. You have Ed, Steed, and Izzy. They're all aged up quite a bit because Ed died at 35 to 40 because we don't know how old he was. Steed died when he was 30. Izzy died, I think, at like 23. So a lot of these characters are just aged oh, up quite a bit. And ah. again, it enriches the story. It doesn't it make does, it yeah. weirder. It just yeah. makes it better because you like because you, you explore different things. It's like yes, you get a yes. different like angle on like a rom com or on like yeah. 
Yeah, it makes yeah. it better. Because of the television my parents watch, I watched a lot of crime shows growing up. And so if gay people showed up in those, it's because they were murdered or because they murdered someone or because they were related to someone who was murdered. And if queer people like showed up and survived <laughs> the television episode, it was always realizing that they were gay was about the fact that they broke up a family. They had to tell their wife and their kids and then the wife and their kids were like, you're going to leave us. You broke up this family. Queerness is not seen as the, the problem isn't heteros and normativity that is being blamed, but it's you're ruining this family structure. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the fact that you're queer makes everything worse. And it doesn't do that here either. And it also doesn't, you don't really have the moment where it's like, we should have met earlier. We should have had more time together. It's the fact that they have now lived through a certain amount of time that they get to be maybe retire together. And the fact that they're older, it's not a sad story. Like when he says, I'm folding stuff and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those, like, those movies where like old men are sort of like, let's do everything on our bucket list before we kick the bucket or whatever. And you're like. I hate those movies because I feel like they're so condescending to, to like older people. Well, this is almost over. <laughs> like it doesn't do that here at all. I mean, they're also not old enough for that, but like, again, pirates just don't age. Like they don't, uh, so they don't age. They don't become that old <laughs> technically for the most part. And yeah. that's, that's also how yeah. they sort of start. Ed and Steed sit together and he says like, I'm a shit pirate. And then Ed says to him, like most pirates I know are dead. You're not doing yeah. badly, actually. All of these stories are sort of just at the beginning, like Ed and Seed, Olo and Jim, Lucius and Black Pete, whatever kind of couple they are. But this is just starting. So the idea of like making queer characters evil is quite common. You have that a lot with, again, the difference between queer painting and queer coding, like Ursula and the Little Mermaid, for example, she's like quite evil, but she's not like queer baiting. She's just queer coded. She's based on a drag queen. Like this is not. Mm -hmm. Also, I would argue that they no longer make interesting, Disney doesn't make as good of like evil people anymore since they don't queer code them anymore. So maybe, you, maybe queer people are just more interesting. <laughs> but it's sort of the reaction of like, hey, please don't just make queer characters evil. The response on this show, I feel like, is just make so many queer characters where like the evil bit doesn't bother you as much. Easy is quite, he feels quite internalized homophobia to me. But it doesn't matter to me because there's so many queer characters on this episode. The internalized homophobia still has a place to exist, I think, in queer stories because it's important because a lot of us experience that. But you can't just make one, the character, the only character that's gay, have internalized homophobia. That's really fucking offensive. And also, I don't even remember the title of it, but Netflix put out a Christmas, a gay Christmas movie last year that was essentially just a heteronormative story with like two gay guys. And it was boring as hell. And it just didn't feel queer. It just felt like a, in terms, it didn't work for me as a rom-com and it didn't work for me as a queer story. It just sort of made no sense because we don't fit into heteronormativity. That's kind of the point. I just love the fact that they just explored all of these different things without, when they react to criticism on Twitter, when people write movies or television shows, I think they tend to overcorrect. So when they hear, don't make queer characters only villains they just strip queer characters of all nuance and interesting aspects. They don't understand that the issue with queerness isn't queerness, but it's heteronormative structures. And to just put queer people into the same straight structures, it's just not the same thing. And it just doesn't allow people to be interesting characters. And then those movies suck and then people don't want to watch them. And it's not surprising to me because, well, <laughs> it's not an interesting movie. Why would you watch it? I think uh, they use a lot of tropes in the show that yield to me like a teenage story, which makes sense to me because a lot of these characters are living through like a second just sort of coming of age story. And so all those tropes work in the story because they're queer and it wouldn't work if they were heterosexual, because why would you discover falling in love at that age? Mm. in like a straight scenario they respond to bad tropes but they don't ignore why those tropes exist either mm. and it's not necessarily just always just hearing a bad trope and then just not using it but actually investigating why those tropes are a thing yeah. and then like playing with it and like putting it into a really interesting story and that's why Definitely. Every time you watch it, you just discover a different aspect of it, which is a beautiful like thing for you as a queer person to just see. And it also is something for you to explore. It just isn't, it also doesn't do the thing of, the show doesn't hit you over the head with preaching to you that queer people are humans. It just sort of gives you a really good story and a really queer story. Sorry, the point that I was trying to make is like, they usually put queer people in straight stories. Mm. 
this is an actual queer story narrative yeah and it's like i think the kind of like pirate pirate um kind of environment helps with that as well yeah all the reasons we've talked about be gay do crimes <laughs> exactly <laughs> and i've also seen people talk about how like this show uses kind of like tropes that would normally be queer baity tropes but then it follows through with them and sort of like it kind of uses the set kind of like romance tropes and tropes of sort of like yeah like kind of monstrosity or that then sort of like works with them in interesting ways and not in like shit ways and then like follows through and sort of does better stuff with them that wasn't a very coherent point I'm sorry <laughs> but <laughs> no I just thought it was interesting I was like what like where does the term trope come from and it comes mm. from Greek and it's meant to like turn you a certain way give you direction in a way because you would think that like tropes would be something that people just overall do not like because why would you want a story where you sort of already know where it's going but I do think that a lot of these tropes exist because we like certain tropes, especially in romance yeah. novels. They're so mm -hmm. common. And you just, in the show, you have like the almost kiss between Jim and Olu, which is so cute because it gets interrupted by uh, Steed and his treasure map. <laughs> <laughs> you have like things that you can sort of discover later on, like Jim's favorite color, which because Olu asks, like, I don't even know anything about you. I don't even know what your favorite color is. And then Jim says, teal. And if you watch the show, Olu's like earring is teal. And so there's like, these things are like Aww. sprinkled throughout the show. Tropes exist, but they need to make a story interesting. They need to inspire interest in you to keep watching it without being too predictable. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like tropes often, it's sort of like, oh, things tropey. It's still seen as like tropes are inherently bad, but they're not like necessarily bad. It's just like how they're used. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 And I just thought it was really interesting how much tropes are supported in the show. So you have the camp gay character, Lucius, but it's not uninteresting because the character is not uninteresting. Like I said, you have the internalized homophobia with Izzy. You have the gay abandoning in his family by coming out, but it's actually good because Mary's happy he's gone. Um, <laughs> And also it's like not about like him being rejected either. It's sort of like it's like yes. an acceptance that he then leaves. It's like he leaves because he's accepted and then it's like no longer a running away but a running towards, which is sort of like yeah. his kind of arc. Yeah. Of like when he leaves for the second time as well. Also, mm -hmm. like I think that they actually now love each other in a way, like Mary and Steed yeah. in a way that they didn't before at all because it just wasn't possible for them. Ed being excited to leave with Steed is quite a common queer story. Like Villanelle suggests to Eve to run away to Alaska. That show did not end well. Um, <laughs> Guillermo in What We Do in the Shadows wants to travel the world with Nandor and actually almost gets to. Um, Sue suggests it to Emily in the show Dickinson to like for them to like run away. Um, and again, it's again, it links to that eccentricity thing you were talking about. It's like this thing mm -hmm. of like, we cannot live in the center. Let's like get out. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get out. And of that this. like, it never goes well. That was the moment <laughs> in the show when he was like, do you want to go to China? I was like, oh no. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 That's gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. You have the best uh, within tropes. You have like the best friend of the rom-com lead, which is Lucius in the show, I would say. But again, it's doing, it's like done almost like a wink to the audience in a way that doesn't bother me. It sort of enriches the story. Like him bringing back like the stuff in a box. But like, yeah. where did this box come from? <laughs> <laughs> he sees Ed and Steed falling for each other before they do. He helps Steed seeing that it's over. <laughs> So it's, I just love that scene where he like takes down like the, the looking glass and then he just puts his hands up <laughs> to his eye. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But um, you have the Bella, jealous best friend who's sort of being left out in Izzy. Again, that feels very like teenager to me. Like, why do you hang out so much with this other guy? Like, don't you already have a best friend type of thing? <laughs> um, like, it feels quite bitchy. Also, the way, the way that Steed and Izzy talk at each other is just so bitchy the entire it's so show. <laughs> it's like, oh, you again? <laughs> yeah. They break up because they both think they don't deserve each other. I feel like they both sort of have this, like, when Steed goes back to the, when, when Ed is left, he sort of, essentially, he says, neither one of us will like you any less, which is just such <laughs> a thing of, like, mom and daddy are divorcing, but we still love you. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Calico, um, Jack, when he sort of angers Ed, um, Ed screams, fuck you, Jack, he's my friend, which I also thought was like a subverting of, the th of not of tropes, sorry, but like of queer baiting, because in like a normal show, it would be like, in a normal show, in a straight show, it would be like, see, he said friend, 
he's not in love in this show. No, the friendship is their basis for their love. And that's yeah, makes it I think better. that's such a good point as well. Yeah. Yeah, you have the found family trope with the pirate crew. You have Steed and Ed spending the night together because they're stuck together. When they like end up on the the crow's top, nest. Yes, and when yeah. they like, have breakfast together. After the lighthouse. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, after the lighthouse. Yeah, that's it. Um maybe it's not the destination, but the journey trope because they um like steed buying the treasure map to like create a fun day for ed <laughs> but it's more like less about what they end up finding which is the petrified orange but it's about the fact that they got to spend the day together olo gets to like meet jim's family and gets to know them way better and just yeah, yeah. lucia's realizing that Ed and steed are really into each other yeah, yeah such a good episode yeah yeah you have Olu and Jim, and they were roommates, which I thought was really funny. Like, <laughs> because it's such a joke among queer people that, like, people will just not accept that people who lived together and loved each other and had kids and pets and, like, shared lives or whatever. They're like, no, 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 they were roommates. <laughs> and Olu and Jim actually were roommates. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's interesting that the show uses so many tropes. When Lucius talks to Ed and it's like, you don't understand this because you're cool and you wear leather. It's again this idea of a YA rom com of like a book. I just I can just see this book after someone like falling in love with like the cool guy wearing sorry wearing leather and just from like the wrong side of the tracks or whatever. <laughs> and like in the show, it's a pirate. Yeah, and it feels so impractical to be wearing leather as well. And like that's gonna be too. Oh hot. my god! Like, yeah. <laughs> how do you get it on in the morning? You need some like talc powder by your bed. <laughs> like, I think that's also why like um, Ed likes the soap so much because he's just got to be like just smell disgusting all the time because he's wearing <laughs> this leather in a really hot environment, and so it's like oh yeah. the yummy lavender soap. I want to talk a little bit about the moon. So again, it's this kind of romance trope, um, but also if we're thinking about freedom in the dark and illumination of the dark, it's also that kind of like, it's the opposite of the sun. Um, and I also watched a keynote speech yesterday and someone was talking about the moon and I was like, oh, this is really helpful. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. <laughs> um, and they were talking about how um, the light of the moon is different from the light of the sun. It's sort of got like different connotations of like kind of desire and affection, soul, the night, imagination, illumination. And it's like not just the dark, it's not, so it's not just darkness. It's like, there is like illumination within that darkness, but it's like a kind of different kind of illumination. And I thought that was interesting because in, when I remembered the Black Cells quote about like freedom in the dark, I just remembered like that in darkness there is possibility, but I've forgotten the part where you talked about how like there is illumination, like someone just has to illuminate it. Or can you remember the quote? I can't quite remember it now. In the dark, there's discovery, there's possibility, there's freedom in the dark once someone has illuminated it. There we go. There's like, freedom well, in the dark once someone has illuminated it, that's the quote. It's the moon. And and so you kind of have this sort of symbol that's sort of like romance, supernatural, madness in quotation marks, cyclicality and patterns, and therefore change and progression as much as things stay the same, things change. Um, and also kind of like this idea of like the moon is something, because it's something that shows up like throughout the show, like the kind of full moon, like kind of shows up in a number of episodes. And it's like this idea as well, I think of timekeeping and sort of like, you know, like you travel by the stars and like you, in order to like kind of, follow the passing of time like the moon would be like quite a big feature I think because it's like you're on a ship so like that's kind of a way of like keeping track of like how long you've been out at sea and it also kind of tracks Ed and Steve's relationship I think so we have on like September 1st there's supposed to be a full moon um but he gets the date wrong and it, or it's, it's supposed to be September 2nd but it's September 1st he gets the date wrong and so they have to create the lighthouse instead and it's like kind of illumination in the dark um and then on actual September 2nd that's the romantic full moon after the party I did not put oh. that together. Yeah. Um, and then we have another full moon on the Kraken night, which is another key moment in their relationship where they have like a kind of emotional moment. Um, and again, it's the supernatural. You kind of got this sort of like the weirdness and these kind of like ghostly things and revenge and trauma, which I'm hopefully going to talk about later. And it's kind of like past coming back. And again, the moon like past coming back to um, like haunt people. Um, I think the breakup is also under the moon as well. I think it's a full moon when Calico Jack kills Carl and then um, Edward leaves. I'm pretty sure that, I need to double check, but I'm pretty sure that's also a full moon. Again, another key point in their relationship. And then, uh, and it's like, a, and then after that, they kind of realize like that's when they realize how much they mean to each other. And then, but then when they kiss and when they're supposed to run away together, the sky is cloudy, there is no moon and there is no steed. Oh, and that's a kind of like end moment. And it's like the pattern is broken 
because the, the sky is cloudy and there's no form <laughs> <laughs> and that is my uh reading of afterlife means death and the moon symbolism <laughs> thank you any questions uh, <laughs> but yeah oh, the moon it just went and then when you said like that the title sequence is also on the moon and I, is that for the um which episode is that do you know that is number um, i'm definitely not scrolling down to count <laughs> um six six <laughs> i don't remember which one was the six episode six i'm just very quickly gonna look up I will say it because uh, Lucia said this and I've said this, the moon was one of those things when I rewatched the show. I was, so there was a scene where they both went to a party and they came back and they were standing there in the moonlight, which is metaphorically used for so much romance and stuff. And still I sat there watching this going like, this is happening? Like <laughs> they were looking at each other like doughy eyed and everything. And there was a fucking full moon above them just illuminating their romance and I was still like this is happening and I knew how the show was going to end too and still because I'm so used to so much queer baiting I just did not expect or just not even just queer baiting but just like no queerness happening ever I just was still watch like when I rewatched it I was like of course this is how the romance is like begins you're watching a scene under full moonlight what did you think was gonna happen yeah <laughs> it's when they stab each other I think it's the, uh, it's the party one, isn't it? It is the party one. The art one. of fuckery. Part- is it? Wait, no, it's the... The six is oh, the right. art of fuckery. Oh, sorry. I'm, I was looking at it's it on... It's called the art of fuckery. That's there we what go. I <laughs> Ah, so it's the um, cracking one. Okay, that makes sense. Again, the supernatural... It's the one where Izzy also challenges Steed to a duel and loses it because Izzy get, um, like stabs Steed in like, the side the way that Blackbeard taught him. And then he gets like stuck to the pole. Yeah. The mast. So sadly, that was not the one with like the full moon starts. Uh, the one where they went to the party was the fifth one. That was a different title card. That would have fit better though. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna right into the show. Actually, you should have. <laughs> you should have. Yeah, around. We wanted a mirror for the last one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and also, they were kind of messed up with like four and five and six. Maybe swap those two around. Uh... Or maybe they're just like even more clever than we are and it's beyond mortal comprehension and yeah that's that's usually my first interpretation of anything when i don't understand something even if it's stupid i'm like i probably just didn't understand it let's talk about lighthouse the lighthouse again was something that it was planted so well in the show in the beginning when you know, they're told at the wedding, you're supposed to be lighthouses for each other. And then Mary painting this beautiful painting in an art style that probably wasn't even invented yet at the time <laughs> <laughs> for her husband and him just not getting it. And then he still took it on the ship though with him. I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then him telling Ed that he was meant to be a lighthouse for his family and he failed at it. And then both realizing that a lighthouse is going to be what saves them by pretending to be a lighthouse. Yeah. And it's like lighthouses aren't actually, they're not so much guides as they, you have to stay away from a lighthouse. Yeah. So like the original metaphor of be lighthouses for each other doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, instead it's like, it's like stay away, away from each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of what ends up happening. And then like this is a big thing because obviously Ed keeps the picture of the lighthouse. Like it's still up. That's like the only thing that's left in the ship. And the first thought is like, oh, maybe it's like a kind of a final remnant of Steed. But also it says stay away because lighthouses yeah. are like, so it's m- both like a memory yeah. and something that's close, but it's also like a, yeah, stay away, be lighthouses for each other as in yeah. lighthouse each other. And the reason he's sitting there crying is because he got close to the fucking lighthouse. Yeah. Like, I had just assumed that the show was going to end with Steed coming back to the ship. Ed sitting where Steed was watching him and just crying so much because Ed is still in there. It's not just Blackbeard. Ed is still in there. And he's just so heartbroken because Edward Teach, like, born on a beach and then, like, Edward Teach abandoned on a beach. I was like... (laughs) (laughs) Was was real-life Blackbeard born on a beach? It's a very important question. And if so, was which beach? Which beach? There's no beach in (laughs) Western Superman. Oh, my God! (laughs) 
sorry. It's a no- it's a beach that's, that's sort a of fun nearby. Bristol based it's joke, right joke. <laughs> sorry I laughed because you were literally naming like an actual beach and it was like it's like and it's well known for being a kind of well it's, it's just like a kind of like slightly run down sort of seaside town and it's got like it's a very muddy beach you go there and it's just mainly like mud and sand and then you sort of you're like it's usually I don't know I feel like the, it's always it's always low tide and it's like the sea is always like a billion miles away and you can never yeah. quite get there yeah, I looked it up. I have no idea. <laughs> Taika Waititi and Reese Darby. I keep wanting to pronounce his name Rice. I know that's not how it's Rice. <laughs> Rice. Rice. Sorry. But like they improvise yeah. quite a lot of that fish and tackle shop and gift shop thing. Yeah. And they were kind of shocked that it made it into the show because it's quite a long part of them just talking. Yeah. It's still the but, most realistic. You're like, yeah, these are just two people who get on being like, oh, just bantering. <laughs> I was like, yeah, if any part of the show is improvised, it's that scene and it works really well. Yeah. <laughs> but I just wonder whether Taika Waititi does also maybe just improvise Edward Teach, Born on a Beach. <laughs> because there's so many aspects of the show where people just say, like, my nose is where I just, I don't know, like, I could never make that funny. But it's one of my favorite lines. Or just when Steed goes, in the ear hole! <laughs> Where else were you gonna stab someone with a skew? <laughs> like yeah. it's actually quite smart. Um <laughs> yeah, I just wonder whether that was just improvised because I just looked, I mean, Wikipedia, I have no idea, but it doesn't say anything about him being born on a beach. Also, just fits into the pirate lore of he was always meant to be out at sea. Or- Hi everyone, that's the end of part one. We really hope you enjoyed it. Keep your spy glasses trained on the horizon for part two, which we'll be releasing very soon. But in the meantime, we'll leave you, as always, with a joke. Take it away. Lily, what do you call a pirate who steals from the rich and gives it to the poor? I don't know, Anna. What do you call a pirate who steals from the rich and gives to the poor? Robin Hook. <laughs> <laughs>